So there's been this genre for the last decade of cinema. There's been a movie ever since it's been released. It has just been lingering in the back of my head like a pecan-sized brain tumor. I was talking about this movie with friends though and they mentioned there's kind of been this genre in the last decade. I don't know what you would call it, but I'm just gonna list the movies. Ready Player One, Wreck-It Ralph 2, Space Jam 2, this movie called Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Uh, you might have heard of it, you might have not. This is a reboot. It's kind of a movie that just, once it came out, people saw it, they said, no, oh, that was okay, and then they moved on with their life. I don't think this is gonna work. Sorry, I thought this bit would have been funnier, but it turns out, you know, when you put a bunch of trash behind you, that only works for a visual gag that is too loud, and then you can't actually use the audio for the video like you anticipated because it's too loud. There, there, it was actually really preventable to do this. This was a really preventable thing, but I didn't see it coming. <sighs> This movie has just been lingering in the back of my head for ever since it was released. I've just been thinking about it more and more. I even made a video on an older channel talking about this movie and I just don't think it, I did it justice because I did a plot summary. But even after making that video, cleansing the demon inside of me, it has emerged again louder and stronger seeping into my mind and I can't get it out and it frustrates me because I genuinely think this might be Disney's worst movie. Okay, let's Dogs now right on the butt. And it might be a little bit of an exaggeration just simply because Disney's made so much. This is Disney's, without a doubt, worst movie, Chicken Little. Frozen, which was an absolutely dismal and wretched movie. It was mythological. It was. This is the top item on the list, the number one worst Disney movie of all time, according to Rotten Tomatoes. It has 18%. Barely legal. <laughs> That is so sad. Like, at least with Song in the South, you got, like, a really cool theme park ride. It's another movie in this genre I was talking about with friends. And if there's more like these movies, name it in the comments below. But I think twice is a coincidence, three is a pattern, four is a rampage. And in the last decade, I've seen at least four of these kinds of movies where it's just, if you go up to someone and you ask them to describe this movie in one word, they might just say references. Chippendale Rescue Rangers 2022 is a reference movie. It references a lot of cartoons. But it does more than that. It doesn't just reference cartoons. It doesn't just exist as a mere vessel of referencing, <laughs> despite what you might think. It's so bad. <laughs> it's it's awful. It's not awful in the sense that like in the sense that maybe disaster movie is awful where yeah disaster movie had a lot of references and it was a just an absolute pile of garbage in the worst way possible. Disaster movie might be the worst movie I've ever seen. I'm just gonna- everyone else says it's the worst movie they've seen. I've seen it. It's the worst movie I've ever seen. I'm not even gonna try to contend with that. In terms of the worst Disney movie, this Chippendale Rescue Rangers might be Disney's disaster movie. Maybe. I really screwed up. Last year when Peppa Pig went missing. But why do I like seethe over this movie so much? Why am I coping over this movie as much as I am? You know, I'm gonna try my best to explain it and honestly, I don't even know what I'm gonna finish. I have some notes written down. I have them right uh, right here, but otherwise, until something gives in, I'm gonna talk about this movie and you're gonna listen. So what's the actual story? What's the actual story of this movie? I don't wanna do a plot summary, but I'll give you a rundown of what this movie is, okay? Movie starts off Chip and Dale in their childhood. They meet together, yay. We're gonna be celebrities, go to Hollywood, we made it, oh my gosh, we have our own show, oh my gosh, something bad happened, we're gonna split up now. Fast forward 30 years later, Dale is reliving the glory days, Chip is selling insurance, one of the characters from Rescue Rangers gets kidnapped by this gang, it's up to Chip and Dale to save him. Throughout this wacky adventure, they learn the value of friendship and... Yeah. The first thing everyone immediately thought of when they saw a new Chippendale movie being made, a detective movie with two characters that look different. Uh, so this is like a Roger Rabbit. Everyone just immediately references Roger Rabbit. You have the live action looking one and you have the cartoony looking one. Yay! I'm gonna be comparing Roger Rabbit a lot in this movie because this movie wants to be Roger Rabbit to an extent. This is when the concept gets a little flimsy though. So the first concept is you have a detective movie with a live action character and a cartoon character character, right? That's what Roger Rabbit is. It's the dichotomy between real and fake, fact and fiction. And that's kind of where Chip and Dale gets its first strike, is the contrast just isn't as dynamic. It's not as potent. Instead of real actor and animation, you just have animation and slightly more realistic looking animation. It's about Chip and Dale, and you can't expect one of them to just be a real character. When you're trying to make a movie that's similar to Roger Rabbit, that's where it kind of, it's just not going to be as strong of a contrast. And the chemistry of those two characters 
characters isn't going to come from their differences, it's just going to come from them being a duo. They have different personalities, sure, but you're trying to make them different by doing them in two animation styles, which sounds good, sounds good on paper. They look the same. That's what the intrigue of Roger Rabbit's contrast boiled down to was. Real person, cartoon character. But this is just cartoon character, slightly more realistic cartoon character. So the contrast of Chippendale instead is more just 2D animation and 3D animation and having that dichotomy where you have 2D and 3D interacting with each other at the same time and even then it fails. If you look at the trailers, <laughs> if you look at the trailer you can tell, you can obviously tell Chip is animated in 3D. It fails there, you just have 3D character and slightly more realistic 3D character just because of the fact they cut corners on one of the main characters. So he's 3D when he's supposed to look 2D even though they try to make him look 2D. He's 3D. You can tell he's 3D. When he does an angle at the side, it's weird looking. It's disgusting. And I'll get to the animation of the model later. I'm just focusing on what you see in the poster and the trailer. There's a clear idea of what this movie is supposed to be until there isn't a clear idea. And another strange thing to me is the actual reboot itself, the reboot of Chippendale. Because Chippendale Rescue Rangers is also a reboot. These characters were made in like the 40s, you know? <laughs> when they were trying to bring Chippendale back, or when they were trying to bring these old characters into the 80s to remake them. Like, the idea they probably had in their head was, you know, let's make Indiana Jones for, like, kids. And it worked well, because people are still talking about it to the point they had a movie made. Instead of taking those two characters, Chip and Dale, and rebranding them into 2022, uh, when this movie was made, they just took the Rescue Rangers concept and pushed it into the present. And it's not a terribly large complaint. If they have ideas about, you know, making a meta commentary on reboots and, you know, the Disney machine, I'm all for it, for using this as a vessel to commentate on those things. The recent surge of reboots and remakes that is still going to this day. But overall, the first impression they're giving of this movie is, we are remaking Chippendale for people who already watched Chippendale. They're using characters that, like, 30-year-olds identify with. The marketing is kind of targeted towards, like, these 30 to 35-year-olds who recognize these characters. But at the same time, they want to be a kid's movie. Maybe a kid sees a character, they see My Little Pony in the trailer, and they go, oh, we gotta watch that. We gotta watch that, because I was kind of the same way when Wreck-It Ralph came out. I saw Bowser coughing up fireballs in the Wreck-It Ralph trailer, and I was like, we gotta watch it. We gotta watch, Bowser was coughing fireballs. That's Bowser. We gotta watch it. <laughs> There's Bowser in this movie. We gotta watch Wreck-It Ralph. This movie is a record, bro. <laughs> and in this live-action hybrid movie following the iconic pair Chip and Dale, they discover that an old co-star of theirs has gone missing and it's up to them to find him before something disastrous happens to him. I've also seen other reviews of this movie, and when the reviews for this movie came out, it's, it was kind of divided. The divide is a lot more obvious than you'd think. Here's some people who gave positive reviews of the movie. Uh... Anyone over 30. Disney gave me the chance to watch Chippendale Rescue Rangers early. I'm not gonna beat around the bush. You need to see this movie. There's people who gave negative reviews. Anyone under the age of 30. It's honestly really confusing to me because this movie is just a bunch of references and nothing more. And that's where this movie just really shines, where it's making fun of other Hollywood movies. Because I'm telling you, no property, studio, or whatever is safe in this film. Do not give this movie credit where it isn't due. A movie isn't self-aware just because it insists it is. A bad- Oh my god, Chippendale Rescue Rangers is gonna be one of those underrated, straight-to-streaming movies that everyone should be talking about. Anyway, yeah, uh, this movie was great. Uh, 3 out of 10. Like, when I was looking up reviews at the time for this movie, uh, yeah, like, people like Black Nerd and Doug Walker were saying, like, yeah, this was a pretty fun movie. They, they, had, they had references. Ugly Sonic is clearly the best part of the movie. And this is a good movie, but by God, this was genius. Okay, I'll go into that in a second. Time went on, and this movie has been forgotten by probably everyone by now. But I just can't get it out of my head. I just can't stop thinking about it. I'm still gonna tell you, this is Disney's worst movie. My review is, this is Disney's worst movie. Probably ever. If it's not ever, it's at least within the last five years. The, the worst part is that it's not 100% bad, like something like Disaster Movie is 100% bad, and you can just look at it and see everything bad about it. You can look at it and say everything is bad about this. There's nothing good. It's like 90% bad. <laughs> 
before I even get into Chippendale as like characters and stuff like that, I just want to talk about the animation. The 2D stuff that's actually 2D in this movie, because the whole idea is that one looks like the original cartoon and the other looks like a, a remake of modern reboots. And it's a good visual cue to show which one's which, like Chip is more traditional, he's moved on from the show, where he's still the original design. He hasn't done a 3D surgery, like the remakes in this movie are referred to as 3D surgery. And it's actually like a pretty good visual metaphor, like which one has moved on from Chip and Dell and which one hasn't. For your main characters, pretty good visual storytelling. But again, Chip is 3D. He's animated in 3D. And regardless of how well that's portrayed in the story that Chip is still 2D, visually it's disillusioning. And there's actual 2D animation in this movie. It's not all models. I was wondering who directed the animation in this movie. And as far as I'm concerned on IMDb, there's two animation directors, one for 3D, one for 2D. The guy who directed the 2D animation in this movie, uh, he worked on Roger Rabbit, and he's actually worked on like other cartoon live action hybrids like Space Jam. They actually did get a good name to do this sort of thing. They got a <laughs> they got a Roger Rabbit guy to do this thing. And I don't know what parts he animated, but there's a bit at the beginning where they, they animated a completely original thing to look like the Chip and Dale show. And it was really good. It looked really good. That's the only good 2D animation in this movie. There might be like something else in the background or whatever, but as far as I'm concerned, this is the best the 2D looks in the movie. That's what frustrates me so much is the best 2D in this movie is of Chip and Dale. The best they ever look in this movie are when they're 2D and then they immediately cut to the 3D characters and it's just, it's immediately off-putting. And with the 3D models, they do this weird thing where to make them look more 2D, I think they try to chop up the frames, like a little summary. Animation runs in 24 frames a second. So for every one second of video, you're seeing 24 pictures move. There's this thing in animation called animating in ones, animating in twos, animating in threes. If you're animating in ones, you're animating for every single frame within those 24 frames a second and that takes the most work obviously when you're animating in twos you're animating for every two frames for the most part you can kind of get by with that because you have different things you can do to make things look more fluent you have things like smear frames that kind of emphasize a lot of movement within one frame and i'm not an animator so this is kind of where things get a little fuzzy for me there's a big difference between animating in twos for 2d animation and animating in twos for 3d animation you have a lot more liberation in how you you can portray movement compared to 3D where you're usually animating with a rig. I think uh, for the most part 3D animates in ones. They animate all 24 frames within a second because when it comes to something like Spider-Verse which is animated in twos and it's kind of known for animating in twos, it's it's a stylistic choice. They make it a little bit more choppy looking so it feels more like a comic book I think and it cuts a lot of corners for that movie because they do a ton of stuff but when you start animating in twos it starts to look a little bit choppier in 3 3D. I can tell right now Chip and Dale are animated in twos. There might be even animated in threes because they look really, really choppy whenever they're in this, this pseudo 2D, 3D model. Their lips barely match with what they're saying sometimes. They look stiff and especially Chip throughout the movie. I mean, there's not really a lot of expression in what he does. When Dale does the 3D reboot model, it actually looks a lot more interesting. He's a lot bouncier. His expressions look a lot more effective. He just looks more appealing. Even though Dale is kind of ugly and off-putting, he's a lot more appealing to watch than Chip is. And one thing both the 2D and 3D do, and I don't know if they just did this to like separate the differences, but they're not shaded. And if they are shaded, it's not really directed towards light, I feel. So much of the 2D in this movie is not shaded at all. It's extremely flat. They also add a third angle of live action. It just feels more like they did that to cut corners than to really do anything with it instead of having to make backgrounds for the movie they just have live action the live action in this movie is so weird because of what's not live action they have a puppet in this movie they have claymation in this movie they have live action in this movie i'm just kidding it's all 3d animated yeah even the live action has like 3d animated background characters for some reason um why why? Why couldn't you just get like an actual puppeteer? Are they unionized or something? And with something like Claymation, I that makes a lot more sense, especially for time constraints, especially in this movie. There's not really a lot of live action characters that exist to contrast between Chip and Dale, except like one officer in the movie. She's like the biggest live action role in the movie. And even then she doesn't take up that much screen time. She's a side character more than anything, but they want her to be a main character. They want her to do that, but she hardly interacts with Chip and Dell throughout the movie ever. And there's so much with 
with this animation that's frustrating. I understand needing to cut corners for this movie. Not everything they could do in this movie could be done with the same polish of, you know, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is a shame, but it's modern Disney. This was probably on a crunch. But the corners they did cut, it's absolutely disgusting to look at sometimes. And so much of this animation is just inconsistent because this movie tries to reference everything it can. They combine a lot of different animation styles into this movie. When you look at the background of things, there's different animation styles, not necessarily interacting with each other, but they just exist. It sounds counterintuitive to say the animation's inconsistent in this movie. A better way to put it probably is that there's a lack of focus. It's simultaneously too ambitious and not ambitious enough at the same time. They put attention into details, but it's in the wrong areas. Obviously, I'm gonna say, uh, the 2D, 3D model of Chip is animated in twos because it takes half the effort, it takes half the amount of time to animate. But the problem is when it's interacting with things animated in 24 frames a second, these things contrast very heavily with each other. And you don't see these 3D models interact with 2D a lot because the one scene they interact in is so choppy looking and it, it's just the best visual display of the differences between animating in twos in 2D and animating in twos in 3D. When they're interacting with each other, it looks disgusting. Aside from that technical perspective, there's a lot of styles in this movie. A lot of styles because they're trying to reference so much. It's good that they put all of this work into merging so many styles of animation into each other. But the thing is, is that it's consistently inconsistent. Because another comparison to this movie was that it was like Roger Rabbit where, oh, there's so many animations. Oh my gosh, Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse. Oh my God. With Roger Rabbit, it's clash of animated characters was based around a singular era. It was all in a specific era, like the 1940s, basically. Disney, Looney Tunes, Tex Avery, that sort of thing. Even when you see original characters in Roger Rabbit, like Roger Rabbit, they're animated in that style, the older style. It's not, which again, the contrast of Chip and Dale kind of fumbles on itself because it this doesn't merge as well because these are two different styles and they look like two different styles. It's just a very unorganized palette of references. It can make a lot of interactions in this movie look ugly. They specifically get some ugly characters too. I remember when this movie first came out, everyone was talking about, oh, they got ugly Sonic in the movie. Wow. Yeah, and he's ugly. I. It's funny, but it's one of the first characters that kind of have dialogue in the movie and he is not appealing to look at. He's ugly. He's ugly Sonic. And Dale's ugly too because he's in that similar weird 3D realistic, you know, sort of animation. And even though his animation style is a lot more active than Chip's, he's still ugly looking. If you look at a still of both of these characters at the same time, Dale is uglier than Chip. Although he's animated better, he's ugly. And when these characters are interacting with some of the 2D characters, the 2D characters are barely even synced up. Their audio is barely synced up to what they're saying. But your followers, they believe the crowd is for you? I mean, they're, they were probably spread so thin with animating so many different styles. With Roger Rabbit, all your characters are in a similar enough style. They're in the same era of style. When you're in the Chip and Dale movie, you're going from My Little Pony to He-Man to, you know, something else. You're going to Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast. And these are all three different eras of animation. And technically, it's more ambitious conceptually, but they don't have the means of execution to really blend this as well as they could. And even then, a large factor of bringing these characters to life in the real world is the cinematography. If I'm going to bring up the merging of 2D and 3D animation, I think this is a good time to bring up Once Upon a Studio, which was kind of like their little prestige animation to celebrate Disney's 100th anniversary. And you know what? It looks absolutely amazing. The main thing is the camera. The camera moves around so much. So even though you have 2D characters walking around and stuff, they feel like they're in the environment. You're watching this camera follow Peter Pan up the stairs and through the building. And when the camera's that alive, it's basically its own cartoon character. And a similar thing applies to Roger Rabbit. The camera is always so active. It makes the cartoon characters feel a lot more alive than if the camera's just still and it's just cutting back and forth. A lot of the cinematography in this movie just kind of it's still, it doesn't change a lot. And it's a really unfortunate corner to cut because it makes a lot of this movie feel stale to watch, especially at the beginning when you're watching uh, Dale interact with Ugly Sonic and Tigra and Lumiere. I mean, the camera is just not moving at all. It just feels more like these characters are overlaid on an environment instead of truly interacting with it, like if the camera was moving around. The 2D and 3D in Once Upon a Studio merges so well together. I don't know why, but I think it's a simple fact that uh, the 3D is animated 
animated in ones and the 2D is animated in twos. I could be wrong about that. It just makes it feel so much more alive when they're animated the way they're kind of supposed to. But I mainly bring up Once Upon a Studio because it's just proof that Disney can do this. They can combine their 2D with 3D and they can do it extremely well with flying colors and they just don't in Chip and Dale. They <laughs> and this movie, like, it had a budget. It, it didn't just have, like, chump change for a budget. I mean, it had how much but Like, 70 million? I don't get me wrong, it's not the budget of some of the other Disney movies, but that's still, like, a ton of budget. I think most of this movie's laziness just boiled down to time. They didn't have enough time to do more ambitious things that made Roger Rabbit feel more alive or Once Upon a Studio feel more alive. I just don't think they were able to. But in return, you get a lot of stiff shots where it just looks like characters are walking on something. The environment is there, and then the characters are on top of it. It feels extremely flat in the worst way possible. But I think the biggest crime in this movie, Besides from the 3D they use on the main characters, is the rotoscoping. Listen, rotoscoping's a perfectly normal thing 2D does, okay? It does not work in this movie. You can tell when something is rotoscoped in this movie because half the time they don't even cover it up. To cut even more corners, they have people in long sleeve shirts or uniforms and stuff and they only animate the head and the hands. Like when you look at these characters that are animated like that, they're wearing suits that can cover all of their skin except hands and head. It doesn't blend because, because the 2D is just not lit. Nice work on this case. The FBI could use someone like you. Tuesday's coming. Did you bring your coat? It's not blended together good enough. None of the 2D blends in with the environment. They don't shade or render these things to match the environment. And that goes for the 2D, 3D animation as well. They're shading on these characters, but it doesn't, like, where's the light source coming from? They're popping out in the worst way possible. I haven't even started talking about the characters because I'm so focused on the animation in this movie because it's such an important part of what this movie wants to achieve, but it doesn't really achieve it. So the characters, Chip and Dale, and the rest of the guys. There's a lot of characters in this movie. Like, obviously, you have Chip, Dale. You have uh, the uh, the other two characters from the show, Gadget and The Fly. Then you have Gumby Cop, which is voiced by J.K. Simmons. You have The Woman Cop. Dude, I've seen this movie three times. I don't remember her name. I think it's Ellie. It's Ellie. It is Ellie. Like, I knew it was Ellie the whole time. Why am I pretending I didn't know? It took me another rewatch to remember her name. You have the bad guys, which I'll get to them. Let me just talk about Chip and Dale. In their own unique, special ways, these guys suck. So in the beginning of the movie, we find out uh, Chip is an absolute control freak over Dale. When Dale gets his own pilot for a show, his first reaction is, after everything I've done for you, you turn my back and make a show without me. Okay, so you're gonna risk all of Rescue Rangers because I'm a little more popular than you. Do you know how dumb that is? After everything I've done for you, do not pick up that phone. And I think we're supposed to feel bad for him? He got betrayed by his own friend, but no, like, even in the movie, it's like really apparent that Dale is excited about this. And I don't know if we're supposed to feel bad for Chip that, oh my gosh, Dale wasn't 100% empathetic towards Chip and didn't read his emotions specifically. Chip is an absolute control freak and this is all it took for him to leave Hollywood. That was the single straw that broke his back was his friend, uh, doing something without him. He holds this grudge for 30 years. He holds the same grudge for 30 whole years. And that's another thing is, um, the movie starts with Chippendale's childhood and Chippendale's childhood takes place in 1982. That's fair enough. They're like 10 years old when they first meet each other. And then once, uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, it, 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 it aired around the same time the show was actually created. So like the, I'm just guessing that because there was, a uh, Paula Abdul and, uh, MC Cool Cat because they let you know it's the early 90s. They have uh, MC Hammer parachute pants and Air Jordans and stuff. Check this out. <laughs> and the continuity gets confusing for me because 30 years pass, Chip and Dale have not aged at all. And you, you could all, all like, oh, they're a cartoon, but they, they aged 10 years from 1982 to the early 90s. So like they aged then, but why don't they age now? It's a really weird thing that they neglected. It feels a little bit more than just a nitpick because the whole point of this movie is that it's a reboot of something old, but the characters just stop aging. I don't know. But going back to Chip, Chip is so selfish throughout this whole movie. He's just such a jerk throughout this movie to Dale, simply because Dale decided to do his own thing. That's where all of this anger is directed towards. So you're not still mad about all the stuff with, you know, Double O Dale and Rescue Rangers getting canceled? Mad? Nah. I'd be pretty pathetic to care about something from that long ago. 
Oh. I mean, Dale has his own flaws too, but they have a little bit more context. He's a little bit more realistic where, because the show got cancelled and his pilot never got off its feet, he's been trying to chase the high ever since of reliving the glory days. He kind of has that attitude throughout the movie where he's much more happy-go-lucky. Despite his hardships, he's still a lot more fun. Chip is just bitter, and throughout the movie, he's just bitter the entire time. He can barely manage to cry. And he barely changes throughout the movie until the very end where I haven't even gotten to the plot yet. The idea is that Monterey Jack from Rescue Rangers gets kidnapped and it's up to Chip and Dale to save Monterey Jack. Throughout the second act, it's kind of just like, yeah, we'll get back together, but I'm only doing this to save Monty. And it's just so frustrating to see this begrudging attitude because he was the one that had this grudge for so many years because the Rescue Rangers was cancelled. And at least Dale embraces the nostalgia of the Rescue Rangers. Chip just tries to never act like it happened. He tries to like, oh, I don't really remember doing Rescue Rangers. Like, you were a celebrity in Hollywood. Are you trying to act like that didn't happen? Selling insurance and stuff? He's an insurance salesman too, by the way. This guy should go straight into the animation pit. And he doesn't really change as a character until it's convenient, uh, because he usually stays the same throughout the movie. Uh, he even like reuses the same, after everything I've done for you. After everything I've done for you, do not pick up that phone. You left me high and dry. After everything we've been through, everything I did for you. Like, he he doesn't change until it's necessary. Between the end of the first act and the end of the second act, nothing changes. And he only changes at the end because... Uh, because uh, the gang's back together or whatever. Uh, what about the woman cop? Ellie. I'll just call her Ellie. There's nothing interesting about her. The best character in this movie is the Gumby cop. In every single way. He is a shining example of why every other character lacks in every other aspect. J.K. Simmons does great voice acting on this character. The character is animated head and shoulders above anything else in this movie. They do so much more with him creatively. They have more visual gags. He's just funnier. It's stuck to my face like silly buddy. Remember that stuff? He's just better in every single way compared to every other character in this movie. Especially compared to his, um, peer, his, the woman cop, Ellie. Why do I keep calling her woman cop? I don't know who this actor is. I don't even know anything else she's done, but she's so flat in this movie. When Monterey Jack gets kidnapped by gang members, uh, Chip suspects that Ellie is behind it. Ellie is the rat. It's Gumby Cop, by the way. And you know what? He's an even better villain than the actual villain, which I haven't even gone around to. The main antagonist in this movie of the Valley Gang. And it's who kidnaps Monterey Jack because Monterey Jack is addicted to stinky cheese. He's so addicted to stinky cheese. Oh my gosh, Lee, Lee drugs. Lee drugs in this movie. There are Lee drugs in this movie. Monterey Jack gets addicted to cheese and he can't afford to pay his debts to, to cheese and stuff. They kidnap Monterey Jack. They kidnap him. They reassemble the identity of these characters and then ship them off to somewhere else to perform in bootleg movies. The best way I can consider it is that it's like cartoon trafficking. They, they put these characters in cargo containers like The Wire. It's like oddly realistic and adult. I, I don't know why. And later in the movie, it's revealed that, oh wait, no, these characters aren't getting shipped off into another territory. They're actually here the whole time in, in the bootlegging facility, which they don't explain why out of doing a couple of visual gags like uh, Winnie the Pooh ripoffs and the Simpsons bootleg. There's like one really good reference where Pete is in the bootlegging facility, but he's not bootlegged. He just does it because he gets to be the main actor. That's actually like a really good uh, gag. And then they immediately follow that up with the main villain doing a Jurassic Park reference and it's the cheapest thing you could imagine. Wow, I haven't even mentioned the main villain. It's Peter Pan. It's Sweet Pete. Uh, it's actually just Peter Pan, but he calls himself Sweet Pete. So at the beginning of the movie, the villains are, are like mysterious. They're the Valley Gang. That's what that's, a, that's what they're called, the Valley Gang. But once a, the villains revealed to be Peter Pan, I don't think they're even referred to as the Valley Gang ever again. I think the whole time it's just Sweet Pete. Yeah, I guess they revealed the villain now, but Peter Pan the main villain. And the main controversy that came with this movie was first released is the Peter Pan in this movie, the villain Peter Pan in this movie, is eerily similar to the child actor that played Peter Pan in the original movie way back when. The The whole idea is that Peter Pan, who the boy who's never supposed to grow up, actually grew up. So that he got expelled. Nobody wanted him as an actor. You can look at that and say, oh, did that happen to Bobby Driscoll, the actor who played Peter Pan? Yes, it did. But while the Peter Pan in this movie went on to become a successful bootlegger 
and practical uh, porta potty constructor, uh, Bobby Driscoll died of alcoholism. And I, I don't think his body was found until like a <laughs> to like a couple days after he died. So when you have that in the movie, it just feels oddly tone deaf compared to what actually happened. And I don't think this is Disney being evil and mocking one of their child actors that died prematurely. I don't think they're going, ha ha, we're going to reference one of our child actors that died of alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna mock the way we've exiled him. <laughs> I don't think that was the intent of making fun of this child actor that died like 50 years ago. I think it's either the worst coincidence ever or it's just extremely tone deaf. Another thing is that he's animated in the really bad 2D, 3D style that, that Chip is animated in. Again, he cannot blend in an environment to save his life. He is extremely choppy compared to everything else that's moving. There's even one scene where he's rotoscoped and it's just, it's so gross to look at, it's so awful. But when I was watching this movie with friends, there was a really good point brought up by Chupo. <laughs> I feel like they could have gotten away with making uh, Peter Chan be self-shaded because this whole shtick is about like being cheaper. That's true. That that would that would be smart. He's a bootlegger. His character is inherently cheap, so it actually kind of works for him to be animated in this really crummy style. Even though it looks ugly, it makes sense. But the issue is that your main character, the good guys, are also animated in the same style. It's like a really messed up thing to fumble on. If you're gonna be an animated movie like this and have all these different animation styles, it feels really counterproductive to have your protagonist and antagonist animated in the same exact style. Um, like even Roger Rabbit, where I think it was Judge Doom, right? He's a live action character that, you know, later it's revealed that he's a tune. He's a, he's a live action character, but throughout the movie, he's a lot more physical and dramatic than a lot of the other live action characters. And especially when he's trying to ruin Toontown, when he's trying to destroy Toontown, you want a live action character to destroy Toontown. You don't want a cartoon character to destroy Toontown because then it's just like, it's not as strong of a difference. But these two characters are animated the exact same. Visually, it's just not as strong. Gumby Cop's like the only claymation character character in this movie and uh, he's just so I was looking over my footage and I did this thing where I had the idea of what I wanted to say in my head but then I didn't say it. <laughs> Gumby Cop is animated. Gumby Cop is more visually Gumby Cop's a better villain in a sense because he's the only Gum Gumby Cop is a more visually appealing villain than Peter Pan simply because he I think he's like the only claymation character in the movie. There might be something in the background, but visually that kind of differentiates him from the rest of everyone else, and that includes like Peter Pan. It is just very counterproductive for this type of movie to have both your hero and villain anime in the same style. Does it create consistency? Sure, but is this the best time to have consistency? Not really. I just wish they made Chip not not that model. I think it would have made more sense for Peter Pan to be in that model, to be in that cheaper looking animation, but they could have just made Chip 2D and all of this would have been fixed if Chip was just 2D. There's a chase sequence that uh, happens in a comic con and where Chip and Dell are running away from the Valley Gang. They're running away from Peter Pan. You know, this is the chance for the movie to really combine all of these, this live action, this 2D, this 3D, all of these animation styles combined together. It's just this really poorly rotoscope Peter Pan running through a crowd and and there's this really weird scene where he captures one of the lost boys from the original Peter Pan. He hasn't aged at all. Like, first of all, they m mistook him for a chipmunk. I don't know how they did that. He's small, but he's not that small. But it's just like, wait, why didn't he age? Weren't, weren't they on the same island? Did, like, Peter Pan leave the island or something? What happened with the, this guy that didn't happen with Peter Pan? And honestly, just like, hypothetically speaking, I feel like it would be more effective if the Lost Boy did age. Let's say the guy aged. Let's say the Lost Boy aged, right? He's as old as Peter Pan. The difference would be, like, Peter Pan has this huge grudge and chip on his shoulder that Hollywood betrayed him, whereas the other Lost Boy moved on from Hollywood and he's just in this Comic-Con as something like Dale would be, where he's just there to, like, interact with fans and make money off of what was once. It would have been a lot more effective of just like exposing the flaws in Peter Pan's character, but no, Peter Pan is just cursed with being older. There's no reason why even one of the Lost Boys didn't age. You okay? Are you in one piece? But when they're inside the machine, which by the way, the way they get into that machine is so stupid. The, the machine activates with the press of a button, a single button inside of the room. They immediately jump into the machine. Why would they do that? It's so stupid. They couldn't do something else. They couldn't write like in the script. They would have had to do like Chip and Dale jump into the machine. The lady cop was in the room with them. She was at the stand where Sweet Pete was. He was in the same station that Ellie was in, but Ellie doesn't initiate the surgery 
injury on accident, which would have been, you know, like more... She would have accidentally uh, started the surgery and maybe she would have been in big trouble with the police that she put uh, Chip and Dale in danger or something. Maybe it would have had more reason to suspect that she's the twist villain. She probably would have been a better twist villain than Gumby Cop, if I'm being completely honest. They even do things where it's like, they, they have reasons to believe Ellie is the traitor. She claims she's a big fan of Chip and Dale, but when they go to Dale's garage, for some reason he has a map of all the places Chippendale aired on a map and it didn't air in Albany which is where Ellie grew up and she was like oh but my grandmother tapes it for me and it sounds suspicious it sounds like a lie maybe if Ellie accidentally pressed the surgery button on that machine it would have more reason to believe she's the twist villain she probably should have just been the twist villain if I'm being completely honest because they don't set up Gumby Cop to be a twist villain at all except for one scene where for some reason Monterey Jack is like hidden in Gumby Gumby Cop's office. I don't know why. There's not really a reason for that. He's just in the office for some reason. Um, why is he not in the bootlegging facility? I don't know. Maybe it's something that, maybe that's how they're trafficked as they go through uh, Gumby Cop's office first. I like Gumby Cop more as a villain, and I think the people writing Gumby Cop knew he would have been a better villain. They put way more clues into the fake out twist villain than they do the actual twist villain, and it's frustrating. She just would have made more sense as the actual villain, but... I don't know. Guess not. And I keep mentioning this, but the actor for Ellie is just not good. <laughs> Her acting is really stiff throughout this whole movie, and it's a larger problem in the movie because the main character of Chip and Dale are voiced by Andy Samberg and John Mulaney. Andy Samberg is Dale, John Mulaney's Chip, and they're both extremely flat voice actors in this movie, which is really strange. For Andy Samberg, I'm not really sure what his issue is as an actor, but John Mulaney being a stiff actor in this movie is very strange because he's done good voice acting work before. Like that recent Puss in Boots movie where he played Jack Horner. He was great in that. He had like emphasis. He had like actual dynamic in his performance. And he he also voiced um the pig character in uh, Spider-Verse. But both of them in this movie is just extremely stiff and stale. Chip and Dale more like stiff and stale. Am I right? Uh, kind of. Okay, well, you look the same. Yeah, thanks. And you look different. Uh, it's a strange it's a strange case for John Mulaney and I had a theory that the reason the reason Andy Samberg and John Mulaney were stale is just because of the way they performed comedy which my theory was like compare Andy Samberg to Billy Crystal who played Mike Wazowski one of my favorite movies is when Harry met Sally Billy Crystal is a very emotionally deadpan actor when he's acting in that movie he's generally like a pretty deadpan character his face is deadpan he has a very active voice and tone throughout the movie and that shows in like Mike Wazowski where because he has a very active voice and tone in his delivery throughout uh, When Harry Met Sally whenever he's uh, voicing Mike Wazowski it's it, it's the same and he's a very dynamic voice actor because of it or you have someone like Robin Williams who <laughs> Robin Williams popularized comedians being voice actors he's such a dynamic and energetic personality he can't help but be dynamic and energetic in his delivery because that's just that's his performance is dynamic and energetic Andy Samberg and John Mulaney come from a different cloth of comedy Comedy compared to those two where I shouldn't say they come from a different cloth but the way they're but the way Billy Crystal worked as a comedian, but the way Billy Crystal worked was visually he was deadpan, but verbally he was dynamic. Andy Samberg is kind of the opposite. Visually he's very active, but his actual tone and delivery of things isn't necessarily the most dramatic or emphasized. Andy Samberg's a great comedian, but in terms of actually being a voice actor, I think the way he does his comedy isn't necessarily good for... It's okay for actual acting. He's a... I've never watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but that show lasted a really long time. Maybe the casting directors listened to a couple Lonely Island songs and they said, yeah, that's it. John Mulaney, though, is just confusing why he's so stiff in this movie because he actually does have like a pretty active tone in his stand-up. And then they said, how did they phrase it? Then they said, give us some money <laughs> as a gift. <laughs> oh. 
I should. None of those characteristics of his comedy, they, they don't translate into this movie. You know that was just a TV show, right? Not real. And I think unintentionally, it makes the crappy writing of Chip's character all that much worse. He just sounds manipulative throughout this whole movie. Especially in scenes where it's supposed to be dramatic and be these emotionally bonding moments. He just sounds awful. He sounds like he's trying to manipulate his emotionally vulnerable friend, Dale. I've saved the best for last. The main thing people talk about when they talk about Chip and Dale are the references. I think the sentiments I have for this movie are expressed in the references. There are a lot of references in this movie, but they're not necessarily good. You might see something you recognize. They might even have something really rare like Tigra. I don't know who Tigra is, but for the one person that does know Tigra, this is phenomenal. Oh my gosh, they put Ugly Sonic. Is that Ugly Sonic? A lot of, a lot of the references in this movie just exist without rhyme or reason. When I was talking about this movie with friends, there's a lot of environments in this movie where they have the ability to put in really creative references like for example there's one part with a sewer so why not put like why not put the ninja turtles or flushed away or something that involves a sewer the one thing that frustrates me more than the actual references are the references that are cleverly written because they actually have some there's like one scene where where there's like this drawing of butthead and he's like running for mayor he's protesting against uh, being against bootlegging which just makes it sound all the more like trafficking. And for every one of those references that are like smartly written into the movie and it's actually made for a good visual gag in the background, there's so many where it's just the references exist. They just exist. Oh my gosh, there's Ugly Sonic, there's Tigra, there's the Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast, there's Baloo, there's oh my gosh, there's Randy from South Park in the sauna for some reason. And it's still weird because even if they don't reference characters specifically, they still try to emulate the styles of certain animations, but it's kind of uncanny. You'll just see like a background character that's meant to kind of look like The Simpsons, but it's not exactly. Some of the background characters just end up looking like actual bootlegs. Ironically enough, they just look like bootlegs of actual official characters. What is this? like um, cars. And there's one positive thing people said about this movie that I just don't think it's true at all. With all of these references in the movies, the Disney was actually willing to make fun of itself. No. No. More specifically, the meta nature of this movie and its self-aware image of being a reboot, it allows it to criticize not only Hollywood, but other aspects of Disney. I can just go through the examples, like, obviously there's Ugly Sonic, and that's paramount. What about when they go to the bootleg facility and it's in this uncanny part of town where they have a, this animation era with all the uncanny CG characters, like Cats, which isn't owned by Disney. Or what about a, one of the Valley Gang members that looks like Beowulf, and he has polar express eyes, as quoted in the movie. Movie. Neither of those are owned by Disney. When they brought up that part in the movie, they didn't mention Mars Needs Moms. They didn't mention uh, A Christmas Carol. They specifically made one of the characters Beowulf, and they specifically referenced that he looked like a character from the Polar Express. They're still referencing a Robert Zemeckis film, but it's not Robert Zemeckis films made under Disney. I guess there's Peter Pan. Uh, I guess that was Disney making fun of itself in the sense that even if Peter Pan was actually making fun of Bobby Driscoll, they made fun of Bobby Driscoll after he left Disney. <laughs> they, they mocked his downfall. And there's just so many examples like that where they make fun of references and stuff like that, but they don't specifically make fun of Disney. Like even like a, something like Baloo. They have Baloo after his remake surgery. Oh, they're making fun of 3D Baloo. No, they're not. In fact, one of the polar bears from the Valley Gang, who's meant to look like a Coca-Cola bear, that bear goes up to Baloo and he's like, I'm your biggest fan. So that's like Disney patting itself on the back for a garbage remake character. And there's also uh, the boar from the Lion King remake. The joke isn't that uh, the, the Lion King remake sucked. No, they're just adding a bunch of characters is voiced by Seth Rogen, and they do a, a bit in the movie where Seth Rogen laughs, and that's the joke. <laughs> just that. <laughs> By the way, just because Disney follows Hollywood trends doesn't necessarily mean this movie's making fun of Disney. It's making fun of those trends that Disney happens to follow. In terms of actually making fun of Disney and having jokes and humor directed at Disney's expense, I can't think of any. <laughs> Super weird. <laughs> so funny. For all of these cost-cutting, time-saving things they do to help make the movie come out easier, there's like a glimpse into something that could have been better. And that's what frustrates me the most. There's so many things that are just lazy. But every once in a while, when you get past them running through Comic-Con and putting, uh, putting My Little Pony, the He-Man, and this and that and whatever, anything and everything, they actually sometimes do something smart. They sometimes put a smart reference in the movie that actually 
works. And watching this movie is like a feeding tube. Most of it is like eating literal poo-poo. But every once in a while, there's just like this little bit of honey that drips from the feeding tube. And you're like, oh my gosh, that honey was actually not that bad. You know, maybe this feeding tube isn't that bad because I got a little bit of honey from this feeding tube of doo-doo. It's like finding a chocolate chip inside of a turd. This is what leads to the most frustrating thing about this movie for me is the writing because none of this would have happened without the writing. So in terms of the actual story, the actual plot of the story, the actual plot of the movie is written. It's a written plot. The idea of cartoon characters getting kidnapped and turning into bootlegs, that's actually like a creative idea. The dialogue in this movie sucks because it's so... I'm just saying, when they melt Shrek's face, it could have been a Disney character's face, but no, it's Shrek. And it's because of the hypocrisy. How much they contradict themselves throughout this whole movie. It, it makes fun of one thing and then immediately does it after. In the beginning of the movie, they make fun of, oh my gosh, Alvin and the Chipmunks are rapping. I hate it with animated characters rap but then guess what they do later in the movie they rap it's not even funny in an ironic way where it's like oh my gosh they're rapping and it's so bad yeah they're rapping and it's so bad i get secondhand embarrassment from that scene too it's painful to sit through it's genuinely painful to sit through they're trying so hard to be meta about these things where man i can't believe we're doing this trope that other movies do all the time yeah you're doing this you're doing this trope other movies do all the time i knew putty was dirty oh you're just saying that because it's always the police captain in our episodes. Putty's too obvious. Think Dale. Dale was right. Nah, how cliche. I know, it is a bit unoriginal, right? And you, I, I, I notice you don't do any meta writing for when you do a fake out death. They do a fake out death for Dale twice. Come on, don't, uh, don't prank me like this. Not this time, man. <laughs> I know you're just pranking me. I'm not falling for this twice. <laughs> You have these regular story beats that somehow you don't make fun of, but even then, the second you can poke fun at something, you do it immediately. Like the uncanny valley of animation. It's like, oh my gosh, look at all of this lazy animation. And then, oh my gosh, look at that. Look at Chip. Look how lazy Chip looks as an animated character. I just, I wish they could have just hired a studio or something to just animate Chip in 2D because he doesn't work. He just does not work as a character visually. And I can't get it out of my head. Overall, the whole thing of bootlegging is kind of strange. A bunch of cartoon characters disappear. Like, if you look at the bootlegging facility, you see, like, Jimmy Neutron disappear, or Sora from Kingdom Hearts, or they use it as a chance to reference a lot of cartoon characters, and it kind of just makes me wonder, like, at some point, wouldn't people notice that, like, these cartoon characters are disappearing all of a sudden? Chip is aware enough to know who the Valley Gang is when Monterey Jack brings it up, but when Monterey Jack brings up bootlegging, he doesn't know what that is, so it's not this well-known thing throughout the movie that like oh cartoon characters get bootlegged you can't get bootlegged no one really knows what this is but a bunch of cartoon characters just start disappearing like just imagine if carlton banks disappeared one day people would know if carlton banks disappeared one day as aware as this movie tries to be there's so many blind spots like that where suddenly they're not self-aware about what they're writing about and they take shortcuts to just get the story progressing as long as it progresses the story they can stop being self-aware for a second i forgot to even mention the climax of this movie where how how Pete gets uh, defeated where they're in the bootlegging facility and Chip gets captured and he's about to get bootlegged he's about to have surgery to look he's having surgery to look like a Rick and Morty character Dale comes in to save the day puts a firework into the bootlegging machine and it malfunctions and then Peter Pan gets the brunt of it and all the lasers Pete starts getting a bunch of lasers blasted at him you know bleh. He turns into what I can only describe as an amalgamation of what this movie is. A bunch of references that have no clear rhyme or reason to exist with each other. He has like Woody's leg, he has a Wreck-It Ralph arm, I don't even know what the cat's head is. I think it's supposed to be the cat at the beginning, maybe? And they had the good 2D animation? Where the way they defeated the cat in the cartoon was uh, smacking Dale's head and having birds activate. And then the cat goes, oh birds, and then he gets trapped. Same thing happens here. They defeat the villain, Monty gets saved, they reboot Chip and Dale and it becomes super successful, and yeah, yeah, yeah.
what's my so i think i said everything i wanted to say i think if i had to summarize this movie in a word it would be frustrating i get mad when i watch this movie but it's because i'm frustrated watching it they have ideas that actually work with the movie like every once in a while they have a good joke every once in a while they have a good character every once in a while they actually have a clever reference they even have one good character that exceeds in every single aspect that sequence compared to gumby cops fight sequence gumby cop has a fight sequence and it's so creative and they do so many things with the claymation they do so many more physical things and it's so much more creative than the final battle between chip dale and peter pan there's only these crumbs of something good and i guess those crumbs are enough for people to be impressed by it because this movie has a higher rating than like the barbie movie was the barbie movie my favorite not exactly but oh my gosh it's so much better than this movie there's just so much this movie could do and for the most part i feel like they just weren't able to do it because of disney constraints for a movie like this especially in comparison to roger rabbit where roger rabbit is a shining example of just going above and beyond for every single thing you do it's kind of a movie where you need to be above and beyond in order for it to be successful because more than any other movie you can feel the corners being cut here and it's in your face the entire time with chip and dale while you have this high definition modeled character of dale chip is right there beside him talking to him in half the frame rate and it's so frustrating to see that throughout the whole movie where you have this dichotomy of something that could be good and the actual reality of what you have half the time and when chip and dale actually do reboot i wonder if chip actually got like the 3d uh, surgery eventually i think that's why this is disney's worst movie to me is that there was actually like hope there was actually hope in the concept of this and actually kind of doing a meta reboot of the series even if it's kind of confusing of who the actual audience is for that where i guess they targeted uh millennials but they were like oh kids will watch it anyways because it's animated i'm assuming that's what the idea is this is not a pretty movie to look at and for something that has a budget of 70 million that feels like a cheap movie most of the time especially with that 2d animation and the contradictions it creates for itself from the writing and the actual execution of what it does it's a failure this movie is a failure before i forget if you watch my videos you probably notice this ring light this ring this ring light this ring light right here i used it exactly once and the electricity surged on it somehow i don't know how the power the power doesn't work anymore and i've i've tried using like different adapters for the actual thing if you look closely you'll see this sun this ring light was made by a company called sunpack i'm i'm, a I'm asking sunpack politely the one time i used it it was really good i didn't buy it it was a gift so i don't have any uh warranty i don't know how the warranty works either i don't have the receipt Could someone contact sunpack you can message message me on twitter heck you can even message me on patreon this thing takes up space and i'm not even able to use it i think the the chippendale demon has been uh repressed once again did you watch the chippendale movie what did you think about it leave it in the comments below this movie's so soulless i think what i, I, I this movie isn't soulless this movie has like like one-tenth of a soul and for every nine soulless moments it has in this movie there's one-tenth where it's clever and it shows something it shows spirit i'm gonna go watch uh i'm gonna go watch space jam 2 now i hate this movie you see what this movie's done to me look at me you see what this movie's done i'll see you next week